want to talk about uh, the weekend project that lasted more than two years. But eventually we had some success, so this is a bit of a success story. And uh, I know I started it myself, eventually I, I needed help. So I have collaborated with James, who is sitting here, and James Mitchell from the University of St. Andrews, Scotland. And uh, in a good tradition, I show a photo of the collaborator. Uh, both sitting in, in the restaurants in Sydney because James was a bit of a last year. Okay, so I would like to answer my three questions here. Well, the title said that we are enumerating transformation summit, but the obvious question is why? And, um, well, and why, why should you, you care? Um, and then, specify that what exactly we are trying to anyway what is the, the object. To, to enumerate all transformation semi-groups on, on four points. Okay, so why, what and how? Well let's start with the very simple mathematical definition the semi-group and that's just a set uh, Equity and associative binary operation. Um, if you like the philosophy of mathematics, then you would say that the associativity is basically uh, just encoding the, the most important property of time, saying that if you do ST and then U, it's exactly the same as if you do S first, then T followed by U. So it is just how things are happening in time. But okay, this is a bit of a philosophical um, explanation. Okay, but, but let's have a, a simple example. So all we have we have a set and uh, we can multiply them together. So the obvious way of representing this object is a multiplication table which encodes that A times C equals C, C times B equals B, and uh, B times A is B. Okay. okay, so this is the object I'm, I'm going to talk about, at least the mathematical definition. So, um, <coughs> whenever we define a, some sort of object, we are interested in, well, when we define a type of object, we are interested in how, how many examples are there. And, uh, and obviously, it's quite useful to have some at least some small cases where we, where we can enumerate them fully. So if you want to enumerate semi-groups, well, there are two problems. It's just, there are just way too many of them. And uh, most of them are, are three male potent, meaning that you pick three elements of your semi-group and you just multiply them together and you get a zero element. With zero and it behaves like like a zero and for, for for numbers when you multiply them, so they are not uh, so interesting. So here's a, a quote from from leading uh, semi group theorists, and they say that why well, why groups where, where you, you have the identity and the inverse operation as well they are all all precious and semi groups is most of them is just junk and, and we really have to look for the, the nice one. So to summarize it, uh, enumerating semi-groups uh, is useless because most of them are three near potent and it's pretty hopeless because as you will see the number grows very very quickly. Needless to say that this doesn't stop people doing it. Okay? And um, I keep saying that our oh, computational semi group theory is such a, uh, a young field, and uh, well, sometimes claiming that, oh, yeah, we are doing it. But that's not true. It's, uh, 55 mathematicians barely, for the first time, had access to computers. And what did they do? Well, they did computational semi group theory. They tried to enumerate all semi groups of size 4, and they found 126 of them. And, and of course, uh, you know, if uh, someone 
is doing something, then uh, all the others, they try to, to beat the first guy. So uh, that was the race, and uh, the Japanese picked that up, and they did awesome in books, and you have five elements. Okay. And, uh, but then of course the next step wasn't that easy, so a few years, um, a decade went past. And um, we went up to the point uh, in 1994, we had the semi-groups of order A. So what happened next is that James Mitchell from Scotland, he had a PhD student, and they were interested in, in some other semi-group theoretical problem. We, we often work within groups of, of semi-groups. And uh, the first thing to check that, oh, okay, we know that we have an enumeration of, of semi-groups. What we have to do is just look at those examples and, and uh, look for the interesting uh, ideas. But it turned out that, okay, these were just publication papers well, decades ago. And um, they just barely described the algorithm. And although the results were correct, but you don't have source code or anything, and you don't have it, the database on the on the net. So what <coughs> the PhD student did, well, that was a big project. They decided, oh, okay, we can do it in a big time, just to recalculate the whole thing, and then we can go to the yeah, stuff. Well, it took the PhD to, to do the recalculations, but now we have uh, a nice uh, computer algebra package for small semi and you can download the database and uh, you can search them, you can search um, for, for properties. And uh, actually they recalculated the whole results and of course they went past because of the newer algorithms and they used constraint satisfaction problem solvers. And actually they went one more so they, can, they know the number for uh, semi groups of order 10. And uh, well, as you can see, it's, uh, the number grows pretty quickly. <coughs> and uh, if you compare the number of extremely important semi-groups, then you see that well, almost all of them are extremely important. And it's widely believed, it's not proven, but it's widely believed that asymptotically uh, semi-groups are only extremely uh, important. OK, so well, uh, if it's done, so what, what am I talking about? But the thing is that uh, what they did, uh, they enumerated the abstract semigroups. When you really just consider the set, and you have the multiplication table, and that, that's exactly what they did. They enumerated all the, multiplica all the distinct multiplication tables. But uh, most of the time when we do uh, semigroup theory, uh, especially in computer science, we deal with concrete representation. So it's you don't just have an element A, or U, whatever you call it, the abstract element, but it's actually, we associate a, a concrete mathematical object. Okay? And uh, of course, uh, we still need the multiplication, so we have to define for this concrete mathematical combinatorial object a way of combining them together to, to mimic the, the semi group multiplication. So, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm doing now, and that's uh, one of the most important representation is the transformation representation. And uh, I will also talk about why this is so important. But here, just uh, well, you know, a, tra a transformation is just a function from a, a set to itself. Um, since I'm coming from the computer science side. Uh, the sets I mentioned, they are finite. Okay, I will mention it, but if, if you deal with infinite sets, there's a bit more trouble going on, but here they are finite. Okay, so we have a, a transformation of um, a function, a totally defined function and a set x, well here the, the set is just a one, two, three, four, five, and that means that well, one goes to two, two goes to two, three goes to three, so so our fixed points, 4 goes to 3, 5 goes to 1. And if you like nice diagrams, which we do like very much, uh, then you just draw these that, well, this is represented by 5 and 5 goes to 1. So it's all nice. Um, there is one interesting uh, property of a of transformation which will be 
crucial later is that we take the set uh, of the, the images, the image points, and here the image set is just one, two, three. Okay, so this is the, the concrete combinatorial object which we take as an element of the semigroup. And of course, when we combine them together, we just <coughs> play them one after the other. And uh, these are the kind of diagrams that James draws all the time. And, uh, he has more beautiful diagrams than all different kinds. But the idea is the same. Uh, well, when, when you combine them together, you just identify these points. And uh, so this arrow becomes this one. And uh, this goes here. So this guy go to one. So what? Well, you just put them together. So it's nothing complicated here. And of course, uh, well, there's a special kind of transformation, the permutation, when, when you don't lose any, any points. So the image set of the transformation is exactly the, the same set. And of course, these ones are invertible, so you can do the other way around. OK. And um, so using these, a transformation semigroup just becomes a, a set together with a set of transformations. And uh, they are closed under function composition. So this is how we fill uh, the semigroup elements with the details. OK, and, and, and again, let me consider finite sets only. Otherwise, uh, it's slightly more complicated and more interesting. But just to have a, a wider view, um, transformation semigroups are just one example, one type of a, of a bigger family. We have uh, this diagram, semigroups as, as we can call them. And um, we have got more, but Generally, the idea is, is, is the same. We, we stack them, uh, all, all of them on top of each other, and, and we combine the, the arrows. And, and here we are uh, on the diagram summing the partition binary relations that sounds a bit complicated. And, and it's by well, combining the elements are a bit more complicated because you have to follow the arrows in, in both directions. And uh, in the middle, you have some loops you get rid of them. But there are different ways to, to apply constraint here. And you end up, for example, if you just consider the one-way arrows, you end up in the binary relations. Or uh, if it's not just a relation anymore, if, if it's a transformation, you can do partial transformation. And of course, uh, you can do the, the transformation <coughs> semi-group as well. So we are here, and these are the semi-group of permutation, which happens to be a group as well. But if you, you do you keep doing the, the two-way uh, arrows, then then you do a bit of partition monoid. And basically, instead of using just binary relations, you use equivalence relations here. And um, well, if you restrict the equivalence classes to Side of two, that's the problem monoid, and that's another specialty of, of James. But okay, it is just for the bigger picture, and uh, that's well, the main reason is that we like these diagrams, and it's very nice to show them. So, why the transformation representation? Well, there is a theorem saying that when we <coughs> do transformation semigroups, we actually have all semigroups. So, okay. You give me an abstract semigroup, and Cayley's theorem says that we can come up with a transformation representation of, of that one. So by restricting our study to transformation semigroups, we are fine. And uh, also, since I'm coming from computer science, uh, so what, what is basically a transformation? The, the transformation captures the, the notion of change, of course, in a, in a digitized way and in a, in a discrete Way. So, but well, if you study change in a continuous way, you go to analysis or topology. But here we do <coughs> uh, discrete structures. So, um, I started to think about how to explain uh, 
this with a metaphor, and I came up with, with this idea that, that an, an elementary uh, map, which we call an elementary state transition, one goes to five. That's the, the particle, uh, it's like the elementary uh, limit of, of the, like in the physical world, that's, that's the metaphor. So basically what we are doing here is sort of the particle physics of, of computation. Because if you consider why well, your computers uh, seemingly have uh, infinite possibilities, but it has a finite state set. It's gigantic, but it's a finite state automaton, which in turn is basically um, a transformation semi -mix. So when we study transformation semi we we actually are studying uh, computation. And when we enumerate transformation semi we are interested in exploring the space of all possible finite computations. So that's why if you do anything with computers, well, sooner or later you will be interested in semi groups. Okay, so, so what's, the, what's the goal here? We would like to enumerate transformation semi -groups. So again, why is it different? Well, because we are not enumerating by the size. What the other guys did, um, they started with semi-groups of size one, then they enumerated all semi-groups of size two. We enumerate it differently. We take a set of points, just one single point, and enumerate all, all semi-groups of that, and we take two points, and all semi-groups defined as transformations on, set of transformations on, on, on two points, so we sort of enumerate by order. How can we do that? Well, there is a very straightforward idea. Um, for each finite set, each size, we have a full structure called the full transformation semi group, which basically contains all possible transformations of that set. Okay? And um, when we want to enumerate semi groups uh, acting on those sets, we just enumerate the sub semi groups of, of the full transformation semi group. Well, I'm um, I haven't defined this off semi group formally, but you can imagine that if you have a set which is closed on the, the multiplication, you will find some subsets that are also closed on the uh, that multiplication. Um, what, what's the problem? Well, the problem <coughs> is that if you have a set with n points, the size of the full transformation semi group is n to the power n, which grows like this. And, um, well, then all subsets, so the obvious thing would be then to look for the subsemi group. You check all subsets and see whether they are closed or not, okay? But, as you can see, there is a very hard limit here. You can do it here, where this is just uh, only 34 million. Today's computer can do that, no problem. But well, especially now when we know that Moore's law is sort of broken, so it's not a good strategy to pay for the generations of computers that can do it in that one. So we have to do something else. And um, always when you do semi-group theory, uh, nostalgically you look at uh, the group theory and, and you see that all oh, things are so much easier there some extent, uh, and we know a lot more. So for permutation groups, when we represent abstract groups with permutations, we actually know the, the number of distinct subgroups and the discontinues, so we can calculate it a bit further, and, and we also know the, the conjugacy classes which are the defined later. Okay, so, well, uh, we usually start in the beginning, so let's deal with the, the trivial cases. It, it actually turns out that the trivial cases are rather philosophical because uh, when we have no point, zero number of points, that's the case when, when we had long discussions of what to do with this one. Because if you have an empty set, is it a semi group or not? Well, it's close on the whatever multiplication you define. So, yeah, it's a semi group. Unlike a group, then you need to have an identity. So, so then. We still have some uh, discussion that how many sub semi groups it has. That, well, the empty set, all, sub all subsets of the empty set is just the empty set, so it's, it's one. 
But okay, forget about philosophy here. Then. So we don't, we don't want to deal with the, with the nothing. Uh, when we have one point, well, then it's easy. It's just you map one to one. And then you have two sub semi groups. Either you include this trivial map or you have the empty one. And, um, and the number of isomorphism classes is the same. And one of them, yeah, the non empty one happens to be linear for them. So these are the trivial cases. What but of course, in brackets, in hmm? what are the numbers in brackets? Yeah. Oh, that these are the linear for them. Yeah, but then you have to one map one that's zero and one that's one, so that's three and four. Then. And uh, for the empty one, I don't think you can define the, the idea of being a quarter. But that's yeah, that's another uh, philosophical discussion. Okay, so back to the multiplication table. This is a, a bit of a twist in the story. Because then, first I said that, oh, okay, if you have an abstract semi group, you have the multiplication table. But we don't do that. We do transformation semi groups, so you build the transformation. But, okay, uh, we have the general problem. We would like to <coughs> enumerate uh, sub semi groups of uh, semi groups. So, the easiest way, you have the multiplication table. And you look for sub tables, sub arrays that are also multiplication tables. So, when you have a product, your uh, the result of, of, of the product is, is also in, in your sub array. So I think uh, instead of explaining the definition, I'll show an, an example. And uh, this is T2, uh, the full transformation semi group on, on two points. And we have four elements. And now I, I use this notation. This comes from the, the computer algebra implementation. It, this just means that one goes to one, two goes to one, and one goes to two, two goes to two. So this is the identity <coughs> transformation. So this is just a one line complex notation for for the transformation. So with this coding, so obviously I need to assign uh, integer numbers. So these highlighted subarrays are, are all sub semi groups of, of T2. Well, you can you can see that this is the full transformation semi group, but it's all included by that's an, uh, that's another sub semi group. And I'm not fully correct here because where is the empty semi group? See it's it's always a troublemaker. The empty semi group is really a troublemaker. Especially in computational implementation when most of the code is not prepared for dealing with the empty one. So whenever I do the calculation and I have a big list of semi groups first I have to go through and find the empty one and just take it out. Then I can feed it into some other part. The implementation. Okay, so well, this one just then you have only the constant map, and that's a, a sub semi group. So this is how the algorithm works with the, the sub semi groups that are looking for sub arrays. <coughs> and um, T2 is a very nice case. This is what we call the pen and paper case. You, can, you sit down and, and you can just work it out. Okay, is one. It is the empty guy. This is the the sub semi group lattice. We uh, have the diagram which shows how the sub semi groups are uh, contained in each other. And this is T two itself. So we have all transformations on on two points. And um, well, is the group group the identity and uh, just the transposition, the swapping one and two. And that is what another group here, which is just a trivial group. And uh, as you can see, just combine the identity with two constants, and um, uh, you just take it, the, the sub of, of that. OK, so this is fairly straightforward, and, and, and you can draw it, and you can count the numbers. OK, but we already see the uh, Probably we don't want to enumerate all of them. Uh, I mean, all sub semi groups, but we are interested in the, the, the types or or some representatives. And uh, and we know that the full transformation uh, 
semi group is, is highly symmetric in the sense that by you pick a transformation and you can rearrange the element, uh, to rearrange the point or, or state, and you get another one. Okay? So, um, well, in, in algebra, this means that you, you conjugate by a symmetry by some uh, group element, but this is basically just relabeling uh, the point, the images in, in, the, in the transformation. So what does it mean? Well, it, it means that here, like we have two sub groups, this is constant one with the identity and this is constant two with the identity. And of course you see the symmetry, all you have to do is just swap one and two and this then you can move between the, the two. So they form one conjugacy class. Okay? And um, that's the, the dark block. And here's another conjugacy class. You have just constant one and constant two. Now, and they are just the, the one element semi groups that actually a uh, constant map. So they are conjugate. But there is this thing that um, as an abstract semi group, they may not be uh, isomorphic. Uh, it's the other way around. As an abstract semi group, there is another one sub semi group which is isomorphic to these because this is just a one element semi group. You, you, you can't really do too many variations <coughs> in a multiple table which you have only one element. Okay, it will be the, the same. But as a transformation, these are different because the image uh, set of these because it's only a one element and here you have two elements in the image so there will be no symmetry taking you there so t2 is quite simple you already um, observe features that will be very important later then, then you have to keep in mind that being conjugate and being isomorphic is not the same so in the previous slide what was that g Oh, okay, this is just generally why you just take a, a symmetry group. In, in the full transformation semi group, this is of course the symmetry group. So the full permutation semi group. So that, that's what we will use. So any, any permutation of the point uh, is allowed. Okay, so now I'll show you a different classification of. Uh, of these subsum groups, and this makes very little sense. But later in, in the higher degree cases, this is very, very crucial. So what we can see here that actually this part, if you just consider the sub diagram, is repeated here. And uh, what's the mapping? Well, it's these are basically the same, except that you throw in the identity map. Okay, so the this is uh, something you can explore later because if you just enumerate these guys, you, you get the other block for free because you just throw in the item. Okay. And the uh, darker block, uh, the set of sub semi groups, uh, where, where you have non trivial permutations uh, included. And uh, it turns out that when the degree, the number of points we act on, it's growing these blobs are the same size growing, and this is like vanishing. Again, this is not a theory, it's not proven, but that's what we observe. Okay, so now um, we go up one, one degree more, and uh, we do T3. And um, that's the brute force group, so we can just enumerate all of them, and uh, we have the result checking all, all subsets and just look for the closed subsets and we have the, the subsemi group. But of course we want to do something more clever, so we use general computer science search techniques, so it's a graph search, we, we do depth first search, and all you have to do is just, okay, so what's your graph? Well, the nodes are, are the subsemi groups, and uh, there is an edge between two subsemi groups if uh, you can get it. Uh, it's a, a directed edge, so 
there's an edge from t to t prime. If t prime, uh, you can get by taking t and throwing in one more generator, one more element, and that if you close that subset on the, uh, the multiplication, you get t prime. And in general, of course, uh, now we are in, in the search algorithm, so we are in a, in a search tree, and of course, you end up in the same semi-group many times. There are different generating sets, but the thing is that if you arrive for the second time, you don't, you can just cut the tree there because you know that the algorithm already enumerated that one. So this is pretty fast because we can do the the, the brute force, the full enumeration of subsets, and it takes. I mean, current desktop machine takes like two days. Okay, if you do this one, you are on under 100 milliseconds. Okay, so this is somewhat better. And uh, so now, now you would expect that, oh, okay, this is so cool, let's, let's see T4. And it's just not that easy. Um, so what we have so far here uh, in, in T4, it, it turns out that out of the 134 million something uh, subsets, we have only 1,299, including the empty one, um, sub semi groups. And if you want to classify them, then okay, we are not interested in all the different, just rearranged from the symmetric ones. We are looking for the conjugacy classes. We have 283, and only four of them are three in the four then. And uh, as I said, there is a gap between the number of conjugacy classes and isomorphism classes, and um, it's well, I don't know what shall I say. It's relatively big or relatively small. Okay, so, and, and another uh, view of the results, and, and here is the, the real difference between uh, enumerating the abstract semigroups, enumerating by size, and enumerating by the order uh, of the transformation uh, representation. Because enumerating by size, uh, they only have data up to this. But since, well, T3 has 27 elements, so we will have sub semi groups with 27 elements. Okay, so what's highlighted here is the, when you have, so this is the, the size of the, the sub semi group, and this means that there is a difference between the number of conjugacy classes and the isomorphism classes. And I was very pleased to see that the, the most abundant type of semi group regarding the size size six, and there are 42 of them. Okay, what, what are the questions here? Well, as you can see, there are missing points here. It's very easy to, to explain why we don't have a transformation semigroup on three points with 26 or 25 elements. Well, because we know that the largest maximal sub semigroup happens to have 24 elements, so there is nothing in between. And it, it's slightly more difficult to explain that why, why these others are missing. Well, you can repeat the argument, probably the, the maximal sub groups of the maximal sub groups have this property, but still you need to give a, a better e explanation. Okay, so what happens uh, if you go to, to T4? Well, the thing is that even the super fast algorithm is just not, not possible. It doesn't fit into the memory even if you use huge machines and the uh, and the, the current processor are just not fast enough. So we have to somehow slice the pro problem. And, uh, and the key is the, the ideal structure. So what is an idea? It's a sub group, but it's a special one. It, it behaves like a, a black hole. So if an element goes into that, there is just no way out. Okay? So what, what does it mean algebraically? Well, uh, if you, if you take the idea, and uh, this just means that you multiply with the whole semi group. So you take all semi group elements, and uh, all you can get just the idea itself. So once you are in the idea and you multiply with anything, you cannot get out. You stay there. Okay, so this is good because uh, while we have a, a sub semi group and, and we, can, we can cut. Uh, our big semi into two chunks, and that's 
but if you know semi-group theory, there's the increased caution. And um, what, what does it mean? Well, okay, let's go to this uh, figure. Well, uh, ignore the ideal for a moment. Just uh, this is the ideal, this is the whole semi-group. And of course, the ideal is, uh, is a subsample. Okay? So we have one half. We can already go and enumerate its subcentrals, right? But the upper half is just just a set because um, we remove the ideal and um, you, you take two elements here, you multiply, and they may stay here, but it's not fully defined because you take two elements and you may fall into the ideal. Okay, so if you separate this part, it's not a semi group. But there is a very easy trick. Once we separate it, we add one more element, which is a zero element, and whenever it would fall, the product, it just goes to the zero element. So now we have two, two semigroups, smaller ones. Okay, so we, we can do the animation there. But if, if you think about it, well, we would eventually would like to enumerate all sub semigroups of S, so all T's. And in, in general, T is cut into two halves. In, an upper torso and the lower torso. Again, the lower torso is a, is a sub semi group, and this is just a set, but we can put the, the zero there. So, um, so what what we did here is that we have the one, the upper one, which we, we fixed with the zero. And it's already a subsample group, so we can enumerate all the upper torsos, right? Containing with, with a zero. And after that, we remove the zero and we plug in real stuff, real lower torsos. So we enumerate the upper torsos and define all lower torsos. Okay? And um, first, we did this in the wrong way because first, what I did, oh, okay, that's easy. We slice the semi group into two parts and uh, we enumerate the subs here, we enumerate the subs there, and we just mix them. Okay? We take the union and see what they generate. But you realize that there are 10 millions here and uh, there's 160,000 here, and we just, it would have been 35 years to, to combine them. But then, then it turns out that actually we can do the same search algorithm. There is this property that if you have a, an upper torso, then whenever you throw in one more element and see what they generate, the jumps are big. <coughs> so you start with T, but you just put <coughs> uh, elements from, from I, from the lower part, and uh, this indicates that, well, <laughs> here, uh, formally and here, um, visually then, it's easy to enumerate. The search space is, uh, is a lot smaller. So, and, and this was very fast. And the good thing is that once you calculate the upper torsos, all these views up here, it's parallel. Okay? So you can go, there is a national grid called Nectar Grid, and you can ask for <coughs> 256 processors and uh, supply supply they do. You just upload the problem and it's fast. You can, you can do it. Okay, so <coughs> now we have this idea of using the ideal. The question is what's the ideal structure of the full transformation semi group? And uh, the good news is that it's easy and it's relatively simple structure. All you have to do can see the, the rank of the transformation, which is the size of the init set. That's why I said that the size of the init set will be quite a crucial property, because, um, so what are the ideals? Well, you have um, the transformations with the rank one, the init size, uh, init set size one, that's the, the smallest ideal. Then you have all elements that have init size uh, two or one, then you have the ones with three or two or one. So this growing guy, the growing guy here is there. So that's that's the general case. And um, okay, let's 
well, how, how we did it then. Okay, so this, these are the steps of calculating uh, T4. And this was the big, big thing. When, when, I, when we calculated this, then I thought that, oh, okay, we had it. Well, this was last November. But, uh, still, it was two months to finish all the, the steps. But I remember watching the number growing, and I said, well, 10 million, that would be really cool if it was really 10 million. And then it passed 10 million, so I said, like, yeah, such is why. <laughs> and a few minutes later, I looked back, and it stopped. And it's 10 million. 2,300 notes. Hooray. Okay, so what, what is this? Is that when the trick was that we are not actually in, in T4, we get rid of the permutations, so we are in the, the big idea. K43 is the all transformations with image set size with rank maximum 3. And uh, so that's the upper bit, the lower bit, when we have. Uh, the idea of image of rank maximum two, okay, and uh, and that takes on, on a and this currently we cannot make it parallel, and it takes a week on a strong server, well, not desktop processor, but that's what it, it still takes a week. Okay, once we have that, basically we have all the upper torsos. So we can, in parallel, find all the lower torsos with the big jumps. And that's relatively fast. And uh, so we have the singular part, K43, and it has well, it's almost 66 million. Uh, these are conjugate classes. That's why I have S4 here, saying that now we divide it by all, all symmetries. So this is not the total number. This is the number of con conjugacy classes. Okay, so yeah, we have that. Basically, that's the bit when we have the, if you remember, the subsumable lattice of, of T2, we have the lower block. So we, if we have that one, we just throw in the identity and we have the other part as well. And we, we don't need to, to calculate. But that's the isomorphic copy of the single point. Good. Very simple stuff. We take, you know, I said in, in the beginning, here in this slide that we left out all the permutations. We forget about the symmetry group on the top because that's easy to do. You have only 11, not including the empty guy, 11, 11 subgroups. And, um, and now these you take as very special uh, upper totals because they don't miss anything. You don't have to put the zero there because they never fall. This is a very special upper part. Uh, and uh, this was a very good example to show that uh, those big jumps in the extensions work very, very well. Because imagine you take the smallest subgroup from the top, it's just a transposition. Okay, that's a one element and the group. And, uh, and the third space here is still huge. The singular part has 232 elements. Yeah. So it's still huge, and, and you get these many, actually, yeah, these many uh, conjugacy classes there. But if you take just the smallest group, you only have 75 or 76,000. Okay. So it's, it's quick, and it's just within a few hours we have, have that. And now all we have to do is just put this together. Okay, so the, the summary of the current results is, is this. Well, uh, this is the total number. It's three billion, and, and this is well, we have to we have the six, sixty-six million, and um, and then the isomorphic copy. So it's two times sixty-six plus the. The 70 something thousand uh, coming from the, the dark pop, and uh, we only have 22 uh, three important ones. Okay, uh, so these are just the references for the integer sequences on the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, and uh, the techniques and the, the partial results are written down in this preprint, and um, of course, we are still 
doing some calculations because, you know, the, the calculation finishes and the computer says a number. Do you believe it? Or no. But uh, of course, we, we do believe in this because I calculated on different machines and, and we had problems when uh, I just said, okay, I'll be calculated once more and it just didn't work. It was slightly less and uh, it was a really tough uh, debugging session to find out what harmless looking change I made in the code, which end up having a very, under very special circumstances, I lost 150k from the total sum. Uh, just quite maddening. Okay, uh, just at the end to show that, well, for T3 I had a table when I showed that uh, there are missing numbers. So this, this is the, the distribution of the sub group sizes of, of, or, uh, of, of sub T4. So this means that I think for 61 then we have the, the biggest and um, this is just, it looks nice, but we have sort of no idea why why you have these several peaks. And of course, you may have other peaks here, but these are quite smaller. Of course, we can easily um, explain why there is nothing here, because again, the maximum sub semi group of T4 is well, maybe that size. Um, but if you think about it, what would be if we just enumerate it with the subsets, well, you just have the, the binomial uh, coefficients and it would be easy to explain. What happens if you uh, enumerate groups, uh, I mean uh, subgroups? Well, then you know that the numbers are important when uh, the divisors are of, because of group theoretical reasons. Uh, if you have many divisors of, of the order of the group, you have many uh, subgroups. Uh, sub but here, it's, um, you know, we, we really have to go into and, and, and analyze the, the details to, to explain that why, why 61. Okay, so, so what's next? What do you expect? Well, um, we are still in the validation phase and, and putting together, but the, the package is now public so you can play with it if you feel like that and uh, eventually we will package the, all this data in a nice format and um, then and it will be already included. Well for four we have the data on I'm just checking it and, and bringing it into a nice format because I, I then you are not interested in the software, you are interested in a smaller generating set of your semi takes time to, to calculate the small generating set for each 134 million or 32. Okay, so the interesting question is that what next? Can we go to the next step? Um, I thought about it and I kept saying that, oh yeah, probably the same idea may work with more, with a heuristic. I, we applied many more ideas. Uh, I just mentioned the, the big one, but there are small tricks. And of course, we go to the big data handling difficulties. So computational semi theory is also in the big data. Yeah. Now, uh, but I'm, I'm getting more and more skeptical. So I'm saying, okay, this was the enumeration, and it's nice, and it gave us data to look at. But now we have to do the real work. I mean, um, to come up with a mathematical uh, theory or mathematical explanations, how how we can find in a constructive way uh, all the sub of, of the full transformation center. And the one obvious next step is that, well, we have the full data for three and we have four. So we, we need to look for the, okay, how the, the sub groups of T4, uh, T3 can be found in T4, how many copies, okay? So uh, that, that's what I mean, a bit more uh, constructive. And, uh, of course, uh, n equals 6 is beyond question because the multiplication table doesn't even fit properly into the computer as well. Uh, so it's, um, the bottom line is the enumeration is, is a good starting point, but it fails. 
because uh, computational implementations are, are limited by space and time. Why mathematical knowledge is not limited by that. You can go from n to n plus one. That's that's the, the real promise of of the mathematical uh, method. Okay. So what's left? Oh, just saying thank you and all the usual advertisement and uh, packages and this is blog on our computational semi theory adventures. Thank you very much. Semis of the whole thing. Yeah. So the, my question is, um, the way you dealt with the top bit, are you losing any information there? I mean, you you might have, um, say, two different structures where you multiply a pair of elements in the top top torso and get say different elements down below in 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 real in the overall real semi group. But what you're doing is you're setting them both to multiply to some zero element before you pack them back together again. So have you lost, are you missing some? Yeah, okay. So first, uh, that hack is pretty official. Just official that's, hack? Yeah, and that's the least quotient and that's you know, oh, okay. like 50s. It was even earlier, so late early some of the theory. And uh, yes, um, but the answer is, is no, because I just take the upper torso and I just keep adding. I take the idea and I keep adding, just starting. I, I basically, when I enumerate the up, upper torso, I completely forget about the corresponding cloud. I just yeah. throw it away. I just, then I, I say that, okay, so what does this upper torso generate? Well, it generates lower torso. Then I keep throwing in extra arm. Okay, so. The lower torso, which the upper torso generates, that's not lost, that's defined by the elements. Okay. And beyond that, I put everything. And, and what, okay, um, this is the right moment to talk about this problem I mentioned. And the thing was that um, when I did the, the, upper, the lower torso and the throwing elements, I initially removed all the generators that were in the lower torso, okay? But since I do conjugation all the time, in 150k out of 132 million, this caused problem and I lost lost a few. So this was, I mean, this was a very harmless looking idea. In fact, here's the upper torso, I generate the lower torso, and okay, I don't have to put the element in which are already in the lower torso. But since I do, conju I do conjugation all the time, this was under very special circumstances. Which is actually would be worth investigating a very nice student project. What went wrong? Okay, have you um, you mentioned that the frequency graph that there's probably um, a pattern with the higher numbers? Have you have you looked at that? Oh uh, no, not not yet. I mean, yeah, that's probably a pattern that is easier to explain because simply. No, I mean, can you get that connection? Yeah. So you get that nice smooth thing, and you said if you zoomed in, yeah, I'm higher up, you probably see the same sort of. So this is five million and so. Yeah. Mm. So if you just plot from say 140 up, yeah. and and have like a thousand for the scale on the left, do you have, have you um, tried that to see if you get wavy? I didn't numbers? get it, but yeah, that's a that's a good point. We should look at that. Oh, he's not listening. No, 
Uh, he is huge. Phillips, <laughs> sir. Oh, another question. Did you have a camera?